this morning. The one that seemed to get underneath your spirit was how great is our God. And as I, I saw the, the all of us, as the song was being sung, it was literally like our hearts were being lifted. And I have to think part of the reason why is because we face great troubles every day. Come on, somebody, I need a witness. How many have some great challenges, some great problems, some great issues, some great worries, some great bills? Amen, somebody, please don't play with me this morning. We came to lift up the name of God. And sometimes in order to lift them up, we have to be honest and transparent in this house. I'm so tired of coming to church and we play like we got it all together. Please don't let the three piece suit fool you. I don't have it all together. That's why I'm here with you, because as a body of Christ, we can seek his face and he will provide. But as I saw our countenance lift on how great is our God, I began to think that even though we face great problems, we serve a God who is greater yes. than any problem or trial or tribulation yes. we may face. I'm not going to sing the song, but if you could just go into that, Justin, just, just to get the atmosphere right. I am not a singer. We'll leave that to, to those who God gave the gift to. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Sister Pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 But what I, I just want us to remember when we come into the house of God, it is so important to open up your heart so that the work that he is trying to do in your life can be done. It is absolutely possible that when you come into this house, your absolute life can change. But the determining factor of whether or not you're going to get what you need absolutely relies upon your perspective when you come in the house. Jesus, even with the disciples, always got on them. He said, it's because your faith. He said, please believe that I can do it. He said, it's because of your unbelief is that I can't work my work. So I asked you, Ruben, though, do you really believe this morning that God can heal, that God can answer, that God can fill your heart this morning? Last night, I, I got back from Regent University in Virginia. I was at the University of Regent, which is where 700 Club and uh, CBN is located, doing some promotions for a film. And, and as I was there, I began to really think about the move of God that is happening in this country. And the more that I thought about it, the more that my heart was turned towards you. Because I knew God was calling me here this morning. And I said, Lord, why do you want me to go on this day? He, and, I, and Pastor Kelly told me about the, you know, the series. I said, take responsibility. I said, PK, man. I said, if I preach on that, man, they may not let me come back in the house. <laughs> because I see that we, as a body of Christ, are in dire need to take more responsibility for the mantle that God has placed on each of our lives. I have dedicated my life to help people understand what God is calling them to do and then motivating them to do it. So I apologize in advance if what God has given me to say may step on your toes. It's all right, your toe will heal. But I'd rather step on your toe than the devil step on your life like Woo, you say that. Come on, somebody, don't play with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. I ask you, dear God, to take your stand behind this desk. Give your children the word that they need to take the responsibility that is on their life so that they can live the life you have called them to live. No longer the latter, dear Heavenly Father, but now the greater, dear God. I claim greater for this house this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 It is so good to be home. Uh, now, Riverdale is my home. Amen. Um, what God has been doing in my life has just been taking me everywhere. So I apologize I'm not able to be here with you uh, in person as much as I, I have been accustomed to. But even when I'm not here, I, I make sure that I tune in. Uh, we had a powerful word from that pastor last week in Alabama, amen? Uh, about the glory of God, all right? She tore it up. I, I appreciate it. She said, I would really shout if I had this baby in my stomach, amen? Hallelujah. So I guess there's no excuse for me today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 
Uh, when God was, was uh, talking to me about this idea, we we're in the fourth week of the five-part series, uh, Take Responsibility for Your Life. And Pastor Kelly got it started with the first two weeks. And then, um, the young sister, so what's her name again? I'm so sorry. Rebecca Davis, Pastor Davis from Alabama, uh, came last week, and, and here I am on the fourth week. And what God has really been dealing with me on is how do we take responsibility, full responsibility for the life that he has given us. I'm sad to report that in all of my travels, I see us, especially those that of the Adventist faith, especially those of the younger Adventist faith, not taking full responsibility for their life, for their studies, for their career, and for their church. I'm sad to report that, that when I came up in church, you know, I got to church before Sabbath school even started. I got to church opening up the church, cleaning up, putting the bulletins on the pews before anybody even got to Sabbath school. And then once church started, I had to then take my post as the usher, and then once the ushering was done, I took my post as picking up the, the offering. And once church was over, it was about vacuuming up the church. And then we would have dinner downstairs, and it would be about putting up the tables and chairs. And once everybody was done, taking them down. This is how I came up in the church. It was about taking responsibility because if you don't do it, you can't be sure that anybody else is. That's right. That's right. Heaven forbid, though, we showed up in Mount Rubido at about 9, 925. I ain't going to even say earlier than that. Hallelujah. <laughs> How many of us have a concern so deep for this house that we make sure that we get here on time just in case there's something that needs to be done? Come on now. How many of us are so concerned that when we see that we don't have all of the money for the bathroom, that that's a burden on our heart? And how long have we been trying to raise the full amount? How many of us have a concern about where this generation is going? How many of us have a concern about where the church is going? If you are concerned, I ask you why. Don't we do more? I'm so tired of people saying, I, I, I want my blessing from God. Well, God is saying, well, why don't you do your part first? Okay, mercy, And when mercy. God was talking to me about taking responsibility, I said, Lord, well, I need to talk to them about a word from you. I said, well, what about Moses, dear Heavenly Father, when he went to Pharaoh to take responsibility for your people? And he said, let my people go, Lord. Is that what you want me to talk about? Do you want me to talk about how he took responsibility and crossed the Red Sea and showed the Israelites that you have power? Is that what you want me to talk about? He said, no, Devon. I said, well, well, what about talking about Joseph and, and how he stood up to Potiphar and Potiphar's wife and, and how he got thrown in jail but was still faithful? Do you want me to talk about a man that took responsibility and took care of his family? He said, no, no, Devon. I said, well, what about David and in the battle with Goliath? Do you want me to talk about how one man brought faith back to an entire nation? Is that what you want me to talk about, Lord? He said, no, Devon. I said, Lord, well, please give me the story. Tell me where you want me to go. He said, I want you to go to a very intimate story that is told in almost all of the Gospels. I want you to go to Mark 5, mm, verse around verse 21, and this is the story. And I said, God, but I've talked about a ver version of this. He said, talk about it again with the, with the, the view of taking responsibility. I will read in your hearing the word that God gave me. Right around verse 21, I'm reading from the New International Version, chapter 5 of Mark. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading earnestly with him and saying, my little daughter is dying. Please come put your hand on her head so that she might be healed. And Jesus went with Jairus to heal his daughter. But then all of a sudden, the point of view in the text shifts right around verse 24. The second part, it says a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. And there, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, the word of God says, and had spent all she had yet. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. 
Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought if it's possible that I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Not maybe, not might, but I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she fell in her body that everything was happening and that she was free from her suffering. And around verse 30 it says, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him, he turned around and said, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? And, and the disciples said, what are, you, what are you talking about, brother? There's all these people around you, what are you talking about? Who touched you? He said, no, somebody touched me with a touch of intention. And Jesus said again, who touched me? And he kept looking around, and then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. Amen. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you heal. Go in peace and be free of your suffering. Thank you, Lord. I want to talk to you from the subject that today is the day. Turn to your neighbor and say, today, today is, is the day. day. Today. Turn to the other neighbor and say, today, today is, is the day. day. Sweetheart. <laughs> when God brought my attention to this text, what I love about it, is it says that he had come across the lake and he was actually getting ready to go minister at someone else's house. And there was a large crowd because the moment Jesus stepped anywhere, Jesus truly was a superstar. The moment he would go anywhere, people would crowd around him because they believed he was the son of God and he was a master at meeting people's needs. And so as soon as he got off the boat, people were around him and he was going to go to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. But then all of a sudden, the point of view in the text shifts and we begin to hear about a woman who had been suffering for 12 years with what the Bible describes an issue of blood. Now, because the Bible calls her a woman and she had been suffering for 12 years, we're led to believe this was not a condition that she was born with. It is something that she acquired while she was growing up. Mm. It doesn't say that she asked for the issue, that she did anything to deserve the issue, but nonetheless, the issue was still hers. Oh, who am I talking to this morning? <laughs> How many of us have issues and problems and things that we didn't ask for, that we didn't pray for, but yet still, we still got it. Who am I talking to this morning? How many of us have things that we get up in the morning and we're mad that we still got the same issue that held us back in 2012, and here we are, 2014, and the same issue is still messing up our life. Who am I talking to this morning? Preach, preach. We didn't ask to be lazy. We didn't ask to get up and be angry. We didn't ask for the burden of frustration. We really want to live the way God called us to live, but something happened in our life and now we have this issue and we're mad about it. Now we have this issue that we can't seem to get rid of. Now we have this issue that we can't seem to shake. But what I love about the woman with the issue of blood is in the very next verse, it tells us that even though she had the issue, it did not stop her from getting the help she believed. Say that. Say that. Mm, nah. I need to talk to somebody this morning because you came into the house making excuses for the issue that you had. Watch out. Well, you know, my mom really wasn't in the house or my dad wasn't in the house. So, you know, I grew up kind of imbalanced. So because I'm imbalanced, I'm a little schizophrenic in my relationship, but it's really not my fault. It's my parents' fault. Who am I talking to this morning? Some of you walked into the house actually having an excuse for why you can't do and be all God called you to do and be. Because something that happened in your past is still holding you back. Woman with the issue of blood had every reason to have an excuse. It wasn't her fault that she was bleeding. It wasn't her fault that she contracted whatever it was that caused her to continue to hemorrhage internally. It wasn't her fault. But what I love about the information in the next verse is it tells us she was a woman of responsibility. How do I know? Because it says that she went to doctor after doctor spending all she had. Why? Because even though it was not her fault, she was going to take responsibility for the issue that was affecting her life because if she didn't, 
she knows what the outcome would be. She would keep leading. Okay. I need to talk to somebody today. What is the issue that God has called you to in your life that you're not taking responsibility for? When I thought about you know my life as, as a young kid, one, one of the first times of responsibility that I remember is uh, when I was a kid, you know, I'm a middle child of three boys, and my older brother Ray was the guy I looked up to. And I, when I think about this story, I kind of laugh because it really reminds me of uh, a funny anecdote of what responsibility was. My issue was I needed Ray to do my homework for me. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I know we need to deliver some of the youth from that homework demon right now. All right, because I know you don't want to do it. Who am I talking to? You don't want to do it. Your parents be on you all day and you make up every excuse for why the assignment cannot be finished. I know that's nobody in here. It's probably just a few of the young people watching online. <laughs> well, I had the same issue. I had the same disease. I could not finish my homework. And so it was up to Ray to help me finish my homework. So every day, we would be mad with science. Ray would sit down and help me go through the problems. But this one particular day, Ray was on the phone, talking to his new girlfriend. <laughs> and you know how it is, you get your first girlfriend, and you're on the phone, and man, Jesus could come and you would be like, hold on Jesus, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so the more I was trying to get Ray's attention, the more I was saying, Ray, I need help with my homework, the more he ignored me because what he was doing was more important. And instead of understanding, what I did is I went on the couch and started pouting. I started crying. I started getting upset. I'm like, wait a minute, man, you're supposed to help me with my homework. What if you don't help me? What's going to happen? And Ray was like, dude, you know, and he started ignoring me. And there I was on the couch, pouting, mad, about to throw a temper tantrum. Why? Because somebody else who I thought was supposed to help me was not helping me. And so there I was on the couch making an excuse. Because at the end of the day, it's my name on the assignment, not Ray's. Mm, at the end of the day, it's your name on your assignment for your life. Not your parents, not your brother, not your mother, not your wife, not your husband, not your pastor, not your elder, not your uncle, not your auntie, not your grandma, not your grandpa. It's your name on the assignment of your life. So when God comes to collect the homework, what will you have done Woo! with the life he gave you? Mercy, mercy. Oh, oh, you know, the disciples asked Jesus. I'm going to fast forward in Matthew. I'll come right back to the text. The disciples asked Jesus, what is it going to be like at the end times? And Jesus uses an analogy to help them understand what it will be like. He said, it will be like a master who has three servants. And he gives five talents to one, two to one, and then one to the last one. And then the master goes away. And then the five immediately invests the five. He gets five back. The one with the two invests the two, he gets two back, and the one with the one was so afraid, he buries his talent in the ground. And then the master returns saying, okay, how'd you do with what I gave you? And the one with five said, hey, look what I did. And he says, come and enjoy your master's happiness. The one with two said, look what I did. Come and enjoy your master's happiness. And the one said, I knew you were a hard man. He made an excuse. And the master says, I'm going to take the one from you and give it to the one that has ten. And you don't even have an opportunity to benefit from the inheritance because you did not do well with the assignment. Wow. If you knew that I was going to be a hard God, why didn't you do something with what I gave you? And Jesus is using this analogy to talk about us in our life, that each one of us has a talent and a gift and a purpose, and we have been outsourcing that talent, gift, and purpose to somebody else, and when they don't do what we think they're supposed to do, we then get mad and say, well, God, I guess it wasn't meant to be. But what if you don't get into the school of your choice ever? Does that mean you're not supposed to become the doctor? But what if you don't get into the law school of choice ever? Does that mean you're not supposed to become a lawyer? So what if Devon Franklin never returns your phone call? Does that mean you're not supposed to be in Hollywood? No! Oh yeah. I said it. I get so many emails and people get mad at me. 
I say, listen, I love you, but I can't do it all. But God ain't gonna always flow through me to bless you, but you have to keep going because he has somebody ordained who he will flow through. But we allow ourselves to get angry and mad and frustrated when we don't get the